you guys spend a lot of times um, not only with people that want to get back into the workforce, but also in high schools now. And it's so, um, you know, counterculture to not go to college. And it has been that way for a while. Why did you guys start doing this? And what kind of impact do you see now for people that don't go to college? Well, I mean, we started doing it because, you know, COVID hit uh, and we've been training individuals mostly with multiple barriers to employment, a lot of them with, uh, most of them with a criminal background, to yeah. be auto technicians. Yeah. So COVID hits and we have to significantly reduce the number of people we're training because we can't have as many people in the building. At the same oh, time, sure. we start having conversations with people like the National Automobile Dealers Association and Napa Auto Parts and they're going, you need to train more people because we have all these openings. So we designed a virtual reality auto mechanic training where we could reduce our cost of training from $16,000 a person to 750. Wow. And that gave us the ability, Jordan, to, to put this program in inside the prison and, and anywhere in the country. And we started talking to high schools. And of course, recently, there's really been kind of a a change in uh, thought process that not everybody is cut out to go to college. So how do we get them a career? And a lot of times it's, it's a financial issue, right? We don't have a million dollars to stand up an automotive <laughs> program. Well, now for $30,000, you can put an automotive program in the high school. And the cool thing about it is we're using a technology that the kids love. Yeah. So, so even kids that like, probably have no inkling that they want to be an auto technician are going to take the class because they want to learn using a headset and it's almost yeah. like playing a video game, right? Exactly. That's right. right. Well, and we're seeing like, kids go, Hey, you know what? I never wanted to be a technician, but this is pretty cool. And I think I could do this for a living. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Game changer. Exactly. So you're kind of taking a few things and you're really gamatizing um, and game, doing gamification for yeah. this this training program. And I think it's cool how you're going to high schools who their main priority is to prepare people for that next stage in life. And now all of a sudden they can say, oh, man, we can really bring in this program. We can buy into it. And now all of a sudden we can give these students um, not only students that want to go into be a service technician, but also ones that want to explore that. Because even yeah. if you want to explore it, there's such a high barrier to entry to even see or feel that. So you're giving so many more people that opportunity to experience it. Yeah, and, that, and that's the exciting part. You know, we even heard um, one of our dealership partners, uh, Carter Myers, um, one of their points was this is going to allow us to recruit so many more young people to the field because they're yeah. go going to want to experience it using a virtual headset. That's right. The other piece that's exciting is women are more are interested in going into the field, but but it's a it's a kind of an intimidating field. It's male dominated. It's very For macho. Sure. Yeah. Now they can do it using virtual reality, and when they come out on the other side, they know just as much as their male counterpart, and so. All of a sudden, it's a it's an equal playing field. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not sure what the exact percentage is now of service technicians who are female, but it used to be very low single digits. And now all of a sudden, they can explore that. They can experiment with it and see what that's like before having to commit to it. And yeah. you know, they they can even get good at it before entering the industry as a whole. They they'll know their way around specific vehicles, um, specific components that are mechanical, so that they have a better um, level of confidence before they enter and do that on the job training with whatever Absolutely. dealership or wherever they're at. Right. Yeah. It's it's a game changer for for the women that want to go into the field. And what we hear a lot of times from our employers, their dealerships, is they like having women working on cars because they pay more attention sure. to detail. Yeah. Not to it's say that we don't, can... but we probably <laughs> yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah, but even on that line, there's um, so many attributes of women as a whole that um, really fill in the gaps of, of males in the industry. Yeah. They have better attention to detail. They can multitask better. They can communicate better. And they can also feel out the other person better um, in a good way, in a positive way, because yeah. they're empathetic and understanding. And more dealers, you're right, they do want that, that women – um, those, those positive attributes of women to come to every part of their dealership. You're right. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, one other thing that excites me is uh, you guys spend a lot of time um, helping people get back into the workforce um, if they are convicted felons and they need training and you guys give them that opportunity. And then you also find a job for them um, through job placement, which is just amazing because of your dealer network that you have built yeah. um, over the last, I think you just said it's, is it 25 years now that you guys have been around? <laughs> We've been around 25 years. Our training program yeah. has been around nine now, but uh, that's, yeah, that's we amazing. launched, I launched this thing back in 1999 to you know provide cars to low income families so they could go to work. Yeah. Yeah. And that How really, amazing. that really also resonates in our workforce world, because a lot of the folks that we train, you know, dealerships aren't necessarily on a bus line, um, you know, so it's not easy to get to a dealership. And so a lot of times our graduates need a car to get there. Yeah. And they all work together. I think the other cool thing is you have these um, vehicle donation opportunities. So uh, for these training technicians for them to be able to actually work on a vehicle. And then that same vehicle is actually gifted to someone who needs a vehicle for transportation. Um, I think that's amazing where you can like not only have two or three of these passions where it's providing vehicles to people who need one, helping convicted felons get back into the workforce and live a fulfilling life, um, training high school students. But now you're actually weaving like all three of those together, which is mind blowing to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of people say that, but it, but it was like common sense, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. actually our, our training program is called the Full Circle Auto Repair and Training yeah. Center because it literally brought our program full circle. Yeah. It was like, look, if we're going to if we're going to if we're going to do this and we've got to get these cars repaired. And when we first did it, we used to outsource all the repairs. Yeah. Right. And then at some point, um, you know, probably 15, 18 years ago, we got a small shop where we did some of the repairs in house. And then we got lucky and we got a 33,000 square foot building. And when I walked into the building, you know, the first thing that came to my mind is now we can build that training center that we've always yeah. wanted to have. That's right. And then to be able to train people coming out of incarceration. And, and the beauty is, is that the automotive industry in general and dealerships now are starting to be so much more acceptable to individuals with a criminal background. And, you know, I mean, the auto industry is just one of those industries that that just people have such a good heart that are in it yeah. um and it's we've been able to help them overcome that fear that somebody that's coming out of prison is gonna is gonna you know commit another crime well they're not going to commit a crime if they have a good career you it's know feeling exactly yeah <laughs> yeah you know, I, I, I always tell the story I, I i do a lot of speaking uh nationally about recidivism and reducing recidivism i uh, often i take one of our graduates with me and in one of the presentations that we were doing to about 400 CEOs, I turned to him and I said, Terrence, I said, in the 20 years that you were incarcerated, did any of the guys that you were incarcerated with ever come to you and say, you know, Terrence, this place really isn't that bad. I don't think I ever want to leave. <laughs> he <laughs> yeah. looked at me like, are you out of your freaking mind? Yeah. And it's like, uh, but I, I said, just tell the people how nice it is in there. And, yeah. you know, I don't know what it is about um about society in general that they think that, oh, people commit crimes because they want to. They don't commit crimes because they want to. A lot of times it's the only way they can survive. That's right. For them, it's out of convenience, whether it's out of uh, like immediate convenience of something or they just don't have a purpose long term in life. And yeah. I think of Terrence Grady. So Terrence came to a SoduCon last year with you yeah. and spent some time. Um, talking with the attendees, um, he was on stage with you, and really just sharing why it's so impactful to find that purpose in life. That So it's, it's amazing to see that happen and really to come full circle, like you said. Go back to high school students for a second. So if you were talking to a high school student that is really weighing out what their options are, they could go to college, um, figure themselves out, <laughs> they can waste a few years doing that. Um, they could spend a lot of money on a degree. Um, they might not use that degree. And I'm not trying to downplay college because college is important. Sure. But there's these other alternative routes. And I think especially on the service technician side of it and the training that you guys bring to the table, what kind of advice would you give to a high school student when they're really looking at those few paths? You know, it's crazy. I used to work in a high school and I spent six years um, working at a high school. I, I, I was the accountant there, but Spent yeah. a lot of time with the students and, and I coached two sports. And so I gave That's a right. lot of that kind of advice. And, you know, there were some of my, my, my players and students that, 
you know, college just wasn't going to be the right place for them. You know, they didn't like studying. They didn't want to go to class. Yeah. But they were they were smart people. They were good with their hands. And so, you know, I, I would advise them. I said, look, look at opportunities. You know, there's other ways to get around. You don't have to go to college as an 18 year old kid. I mean, look, how many of us at 18 years old had any idea what we were? I was an architecture <laughs> major my first year in college. Had no, no really. idea what I was doing. Right. Um, yeah. Ended up majoring, I think, in 15 different things before yeah. I finally may end up in accounting. And I only ended up in accounting because I found it to be easy and I only had two years left to go and I wanted to get out in four. That's right. <laughs> you wanted to get it done. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not like that just because you don't go to college when you're 18 means that you can't go to college. Yeah. Why not go out and earn a living and decide what you want to do and you know, maybe at the age of 25 or 26, you say, you know what, what I really want to do is start my own business. And yeah, I'm right. going to go back and get a business degree. And I'm going to use the experience I've had as an auto technician to build a business career. Um, yeah. I, so I think that there's there's opportunities. And, and again, I, I was a coach for a long time, I used to coach um, club lacrosse. And I worked with a lot of high school kids. And you know, I could just see the, the blank stare on their face when they started talking about what do you want to do when you're in college? It was like, how am I supposed to know? I'm at 17 years old. And, yeah, and that's right. me, what I want to do the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, right now, I just want to make it through high school. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, we, we have that conversation a lot. Um, Jordan, I, I remember years ago, um, I sit on the governor's workforce development board here in Maryland. And um the, the folks who ran the, they call it the CTE program, right? The technical education program came in and did a presentation and, you know, talked about how they were struggling to get people into CTE programs. But they talked about how they had trained some kids, some of them as auto technicians that came out of school and they were making 40, 30 to $40,000 a year the first year out of college. Yeah. And I, I said to her, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, when, when a student goes to their high school graduation and they walk across the stage and they have a, a, a scholarship to University of Maryland or University of Indiana, or whatever, do they announce that they got a scholarship? She says, oh yeah, all the time. I said, when well, one of your students walks across that stage and they have a job starting at $35,000 a year, do they announce that? She said, no, they never do. I said, you wanna get parents interested in sending their kids to a CTE program? Yeah. Have them sit in that audience and hear that, you know, John just got a job making thirty seven thousand dollars a year. And she's looking at her, her other son going, you know, your grades aren't that good. Maybe we should <laughs> consider college, you know? Yeah, and that's I right. Just, it's all a marketing thing. And, and for yes. years, as you know, high schools were were determined to get people into college. And that was the push. Now it's the, the world's changing for sure. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, I look back to my own um, experience, too, with college, and I didn't know that you actually went to study architecture first, because that's what I did, too. I went there oh, for yeah. a year because that's what I liked in high school, um, got attached to an architecture program. And after that first year, I transitioned that to business finance because it was a lot more. What's the right way to say it? It was a it was a vague enough uh study that i can use that in a lot of different ways right because so, i wanted to, i wanted to really get that value out of that and i, I also wanted to be done in four years which we, uh, i was luckily, the same I was way yeah. yeah exactly and uh but you're right is that when we celebrate these one thousand or five thousand dollar scholarships that these students get we should also be celebrating their other wins that the other students have which is 35 grand 40 yeah. grand that they're getting that very first year Absolutely. and they're not one of the ones, so you brought up CMA already, um, but CMA, Liza Borshitz, what they do is they also do a high school signing day for yeah. students that commit to going to work for CMA or go into a technician program with them. Yes. And that's just one another way that they can celebrate those students' decisions. And not just that, but also continue to push that perception change, um, you know, for the overall community that, man, this is an actual skill that people can learn and it benefits them long term. Um, I can only imagine how many other interactions you've had with dealers who do something very similar to that. Yeah. I mean, and even think about like a lot of the guys, you know, when, when we're training them here in our brick and mortar facilities, sure. you know, within, within four or five weeks, these guys are out making $200 a weekend 
yeah. doing old changes and brakes and tire and, and stuff That's right. for people. And they're working on their own cars. You know, they'll come in and yeah. say, you know, I, I, I saved myself a thousand dollars this weekend because I, I didn't have to do my yeah. own brakes. You How know, funny, and, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like you said, it's a, this is a skill that you can use the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. Whether you work on your own car, whether you work on neighbors cars and and, you know, or whether you get a job doing it. I mean, it, you know, it, it's it's a great skill. Um, I, I would uh, look, I have no automotive background at all. I wish I had learned when I was in school. <laughs> sure. when I was younger. You know, I graduated high school in 73. Cars were a whole lot easier to work on back then. And myself and my buddies used to work on our own cars, but um, never through any kind of of you know, real education to do it. But it's, and I think the other piece of it is, is now in the automotive industry, kids just need to realize that it's, it's not a grease monkey job anymore. That's right. You know, I mean, some of these deal, most of the dealerships are cleaner than, than some of the hospitals you're going to go to. <laughs> That's right. Which is a little, <laughs> a little scary, but um, yeah. <laughs> No, but you're exactly right. There's all these great opportunities. And I think it just comes down to that perception of what people used to think of that. And um, the generation before us, unfortunately, thought that we had to go to college to be successful. Um, for heaven's sakes, my my great aunt. Now, she's a, she's a little bit past the last generation. She, so she's 91. But for her in 1959, it was a big deal to graduate. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. 1949. It was a big deal to graduate high school. And that's just what happened is that then people yeah. said, oh, it's a big deal to graduate college. And that's what so many parents, their dreams were for their kids was for them to go to college. And I think there's just so many um, other opportunities now. And the thing that comes to my mind, Marty, is if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. And if you teach him to fish, then he can eat for a lifetime. Absolutely. There's so many skills that come from that that they can learn and use over their lifetime. Um, so, Marty, thanks so much for sharing this today. For people that want to learn more about Vehicles for Change, what's the best way that they can learn about you guys? Yeah, is to go to our website at uh, vehiclesforchange.org, and that's for all spelled out. So it's vehiclesforchange.org because we are a nonprofit organization. Um, and we're excited about you know, the opportunities, uh, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of jobs in the automotive industry that are going to be open. Um, and, and using our virtual reality doesn't just get you in autom- as a technician. What a great skill to have if you're a service advisor or a parts person, right. right? So to be able to have that skill, and maybe I don't want to be a technician, maybe I don't like picking up tools, and but if I can learn it using virtual reality, I can still go in the field and be actually head and shoulders above some of the people that are already service technicians yeah yeah how cool so marty thank you so much for joining me today it's always a pleasure to connect deeper with you have great conversations with you and thanks for everything you're doing for the industry it's clear you're making so many great changes thanks jordan happy to be here